morning, church. I am reminded of some 58 years ago. I wasn't here, I'm just saying I'm reminded of some 58 years ago. A young man who was planning a major event for his school asked a poignant question. And that question is, is there anyone that can tell me what Christmas is all about? And an unsuspecting peer of his walked up, one who had the spirit of timidity, who carried around a security blanket as his only mode of safety. But with great authority, he responded to his friend. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. That friend was Linus talking to his best friend, Charlie Brown. And then he stood before his peers throughout the school as they planned for the school play. And he said these words. He said, lights please. And he read from the scripture that I'll read to you on today. Luke chapter 2. Now he read only a few verses uh, because they only had a 30 minute special. I have a little bit longer than that. <laughs> But I'm going to read from verses 8 down through verse 20. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, as we talk about this Advent season. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying, to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for, they had heard, for what they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. Help me, help this congregation and everyone that will listen to this message from you to see that you are glorified in this process, that I am minimized in it. And Lord, help us to glorify you in this season especially, but in all seasons. It is about you coming to save our souls. And Lord, we acknowledge that one day you will come back. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time, and we ask that you bless our time together and that we all learn something from this which you have given to me. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. 
So let's take a look at this passage. Uh, if, if anyone knows me, they know that I am somewhat nostalgic. If you heard from me last night, if you were at the marriage ministry event that we had last night, I talked about things from my growing up. But uh, that is a very, sp what I like about that, that, that particular, that's probably the only animated series that I'll watch too much now, is the Charlie Brown Christmas. That's about it. I don't, I never was, I mean, I liked cartoons growing up, but that's one animated series that I will watch or show that I will watch because it's one that they've somehow, for 58 years, they've allowed this particular cartoon animated series to stay on during the Christmas holiday and continue to allow Linus to talk about what that season is all about. But Linus refers to it as what? Christmas. But I want us to try to get out of that mindset and think more on the lines of Advent, which means a coming. That, 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 that Jesus is coming, a Messiah is coming. And that's what was taking place at this time. He had, at this time, he had already been born, and so these shepherds were receiving word of his birth. So it's very important to understand that this season that we're talking about can be minimized by the titles that we give it now, like Christmas and, and Xmas and, 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 and the holiday season. It's very general. But this is about Christ's original coming to be the incarnate Christ, the incarnate Savior for you and I. So how do we minimize it to these other things? And that's what the whole show was about, is that Charlie Brown was so frustrated that, that, that Christmas had become so commercialized. Well, Charlie, if you saw America in 2023, <laughs> you would have never anticipated just a few bells that, and, and lights and whistles and things that Snoopy had on his house. That, that, was, my, that was small stuff. It's another level now. Charlie Brown, the Christmas decorations are out at Home Depot in September now. Because that's what it's become about. But I want to just break down some things here as we look at this text today. And I want to leave you with a few things that you can remember as to why it is so important during this season. And keep this in mind. Godliness versus worldliness. Secular versus sacred. And what we're talking about in the text is sacred. But I'm also going to come back later and show you and give you some warnings that Paul gave us about this season. And what, or about any season, or about what they will try to do to the truth of the scriptures. Paul wasn't necessarily talking about this season, but it is applicable to what we're experiencing now in our world today. So in verse 8, it says, in the same region there were some shepherds. Shepherds, what do we know about shepherds? There is much debate on the social status of shepherds. In first century Israel, there are some that say that they were social outcasts, misfits. And then there's others that say that wasn't necessarily true because of the fact that, that when they came and brought the news of Jesus' birth and what, they were, what was shared with them by the angels, when they did that, it was credible and it was received. But shepherding is not the upper echelon of society. Notice these angels did not come to the religious leaders, to political figures, they came to common laborers working in the field on the night shift. <laughs> and so the thing we want to remember, and then it gets to verse 10, and it says, this is good news, you shepherds. I want you to share this. This is good news for what? All the people. So the first thing I want you to remember when we talk about this particular passage is that this message that the, uh, of, the, of the Advent, the message of the Advent is a message for everyone. It's a message for everyone. Came to common laborers, and it was a message for everyone who was seeking a Messiah or one that would desire to be saved. And that is what he clearly depicts here. But if we go back just a little bit, 
What is occurring here with the shepherds and what is a, a taking place was already prophesied in Isaiah's prophecy. You know in Isaiah's prophecy, Jesus is referred to, the, the Christ child is referred to as Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. God with us. And it was, that was in uh, Isaiah chapter 7. But in Isaiah chapter 9, he gives a little bit more detail because he says, this one that will, this child that will be born, this child that will be born will be born, but the government will rest upon his shoulders. Which means that an individual that, if you were a king, if you were in leadership, you wore a robe that would have been adorned on your shoulders. And that's why it says that that was a sign that, that the government would rest upon his shoulders. That's what it means. And it says he will be referred to as Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Micah's prophecy prophesies about this. And even there's some, there's some other prophecy, even in the, in, in, uh, in the Pentateuch, in, in Numbers, where it talks about this Messiah that will come, this root that will come out and will, will, will come and will rule, but it also speaks to the judgment that he will do. So it's really speaking not to only his first advent, but his second advent. So there's some things you just want to remember. So, remember, this is a message that is for everyone. He comes to commoners, and he says, this is, and the angel says, this is for all the people. And then in verse 9, it says, the angel stood before him, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were frightened. So, the second thing I want you to remember is, the Advent season, this is an extraordinary event. This is an angel talking to men on their job. They're going about their business. They had no idea this was happening. This is true to form of who God is, as we'll find in the second advent, because we don't know when he's going to show up. But he's coming back, and we need to be ready at all times. And so, these men were there, and the glory of the Lord came around, and they were frightened. But the angel tells them, fear not. Fear not. No doubt in my mind, if I'm out working late in the middle of the night and an angel comes, I would be frightened as well. So this is all normal behavior. I can read this text 50 times. Let me go down to Arkansas where I grew up and be out in a field <laughs> and an angel shows up. I don't care how many times I've read this, I'll be frightened, at least initially. Yes. At least initially. But he says, the angel says, fear not. Fear not. And I think that's, he says, because there's good news. Some text says of great tidings for all men. It's good news. What does that mean? What does that mean? That the advent of Christ is also encouraging to us. That ought to be encouragement that a Savior is born. It's good news. I'm not coming to deliver bad news. This is not a cataclysmic event to end the world. No, this is good news to say, get right now. Get right now. And so it is very encouraging. And then I love in verse 11 when they said this to him, when the angel said this to him. He says, for today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The angel gives three titles to this child that is born. He, first, he says, Savior. He says, Savior, which comes from the Greek word soter. And we get the word soteriology from this, which is the doctrine of salvation by which we are saved. And he's explaining to this audience of shepherds that the person that has been born is one that has come, is essential to your salvation. He is your savior. He is your savior. But then he goes on to say the Christ, that he's Christ, meaning Messiah, the anointed one, one that has come from God, in fact, one that is God. Because we learn from Isaiah's prophecy, again, Almighty God, he's the eternal father, prince of peace, wonderful counselor. This is what we have to really grasp. 
This is God birthing himself into the world. This does not denounce Trinitarian thought. I'm not going to go into all the details of Trinitarianism tonight and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but Jesus is coming into the world as the second person of the Trinity. And it says he is the eternal Father, Almighty God. And it stays true to Colossians 1.15 that he is the image of the invisible God. And this is how he shows up. So not only is this an extraordinary event, and we go back to it being extraordinary because we know that what? Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit by God himself. This was not a, a typical conception. It's called the Immaculate Conception. I think Pastor James was saying one of his children was, was talking about the Immaculate Conception. I hadn't gotten that far with my kids yet, but it's probably a good place to start. But it's an Immaculate Conception that, that, the, that, that, that Jesus is coming. So this is an extraordinary event, but it is essential to our lives. And it says he is of God. And he says that the, the angel says that he's the Lord. He's the Lord, which means master, one who has power yes. and authority. Yes. Power and authority, which implies that there is some long-term effect of when Jesus will have that power and authority. He has the power now, but there's another level of power that he's going to come at, with in, at a later time, which has some eternal implications to it, that Jesus is Lord. He's the one that will reign forever and that child is being born. That's what the angels are communicating to these common laborers. And then it goes on a little bit further. He says that there's, there, this will be a sign for you that the babe will be wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. Well, what's the sign? The sign is this. The sign is not that the child is wrapped in cloths. That was commonplace for first century Israel babies. And in fact, when you died, you would be wrapped in cloths. When Jesus, was di when Jesus died, when he was buried, he was wrapped in cloths. When he was born, he was wrapped in cloths. That wasn't anything unique. So what they were saying to them is, well, what's unique? Here's the sign. You're going to find this baby in a manger. And a manger is simply this. It's a trough. It's what animals eat out of. Now, if you take a look at this, this is what they believe is a close depiction of what a trough would have looked like or a manger would have looked like in uh, first century Israel. It looks quite a bit different from what you see in people's yards <laughs> in their nativity scenes. Those look like you could probably just go out in your front yard and lay in it yourself. This doesn't look too promising. So this would have been something very similar to what Christ would have been laid in, possibly in a stall where animals were, but placed in there. Not as neat as we do in our nativity scenes, but this is the manger that he would have been in, or something like this. And so the sign is, it has to be something unique about where this child is. There may be other children born in Bethlehem, but there's not one, only one is going to be buried or uh, born and laying in a what? Manger. I'm getting ahead of myself because he hadn't died yet. He's born. <laughs> manger. He's in a manger. And that's the sign. So we want to pay a very close attention to that. Very close attention to that. And it says, and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. Not only one angel, now a multitude, which is an innumerable number of angels, and like an army, a sea of angels that come around and they give the highest glory to God. That's where we get the term or the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to a Newborn King. And they acknowledge him. And so there's this multitude of angels. I'm trying to paint the picture here, folks. That's what this season is about. This is about a Savior coming, the Christ, God himself, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's what this season is about. And I just want to paint that picture because we're going to go somewhere in a minute and it's going to look a lot different from what we're reading in the text. But it does prompt something for us. 
Because after they've done this, the shepherds begin to ponder, wait a minute. We just heard from angels. Now, if you look back, the angels did not tell them. They did not tell them. You need to go see this child. He just said, you will find the babe. They didn't give them any directions. But they were so compelled by the testimony that came from God through these angels, you have to go and tell somebody about it. And that's how we have to be today. That we ought to have an experience with God that it compels us to go and tell somebody about it. We ought to be encouraged to do it. And so they could not wait. They said they hurried and did it. And they went and told Mary and Joseph, found the baby and told them what they had heard. And this is what I want to stress today about this season. That all of these extraordinary events, what has taken place, it compelled these men to go and evangelize and tell people the good news. And somebody was saying, well, that's not canvassing. They didn't go. Yes, they did. They told people what happened. Because good news, as it's used in this term here, is the word we use for evangelism. Right there in verse 10. Good news. And they went and spread that news, and it was received well. It was received, and people believed it, and people were marveled by what they said. And so they made these statements known. So in a few verses you'll see in here where they make the statements known. What does that tell us? That which we learned about Christ, we ought to be telling it just as it was told to us. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. And that's what's missing. That's what's missing. But last but not least, in verse 20, it says that they went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. They're glorifying God. So not only should we be evangelizing, but we should be exalting him. We should be lifting him up, focusing on him, because he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the promised Messiah. He is our Savior. Amen. And so we should be exalted, exalting him. And they did just as they were told. Now, here's the warning sign right here. Somewhere along the way, we've lost our way. How we get from a Messiah the Messiah, definite article. The only way by which we can be saved. How do we get from that to running out on the Friday after Thanksgiving to pick up a $98 TV on sale? It lets you see how easily we drift off. And there's a reason for this. This is no accident. In the round of time that the Charlie Brown Christmas special came out, there was a thing that we called back then the gross national product. And the gross national product at that time was somewhere in the 700 billions. Right now, that gross national, the gross, now we call it the gross domestic product, is in the trillions. And a large portion of the gross domestic product or gross national product at that time is that thing, the gross national product is that which gives you a good economic indicator of the strength of one's economy. And 63% of the gross national product in about the time of the Charlie Brown special was somewhere at 63%, about 400 and something billion dollars that was devoted to goods and services that would go to consumers. What we take in, stuff. And so the economy is built around consumers taking in things, buying things. What more perfect time in the year 
to get people to buy into consumerism than the fourth quarter of the year. Like I said earlier, the decorations are going out early now, folks. They're in September. They're already out. It used to be right after the candy got off the shelves in, on Halloween. Now they're on there in September because the U.S. economy depends on fourth quarter earnings and retail earnings. Depends on it. October, November, December. How ironic. Three big things happen. October, November, December. I like to call them the three T's, the months of the three T's. Treats, turkeys, and toys. <laughs> and we want to consume it all. Each of them are built around this. How much candy can you take in? How much turkey and everything else can you eat? And how many toys can you give? And that's how we veer off the track. But what did Paul tell us in Colossians 2.8? He says, see to it that no one takes you captive with philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world. Now, when Paul is speaking of this, he's speaking of false teachers coming in with new doctrines, strange doctrines, fables, and lies. Well, folks, we've taken it to another, another level in America. This isn't even about religion. We've taken a whole thing and made it about this season that has nothing to do with the Lord. Trees, lights, Santa Claus. There is no such thing as Santa Claus. Nothing. In fact, I heard a, 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 a staunch evangelical pastor get up and preach and talk about the myth of Santa Claus. But he stopped short. He was like, well, he's a harmless myth. I, 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 wouldn't go to, I wouldn't go that far as to say it's a harmless myth, North Dallas. Because we take the child in their, in their early developmental years and begin to shape them with this notion that the season is about them. It's all about us. It's about me. What can you get? We flipped this thing about an alleged three wise men, which is never any message of a three wise men in the, in the uh, Matthew narrative. It's just three types of gifts that were given. But we take this, and now we flipped it and somehow made it work where we receive gifts. Me saying... There's no such thing as Santa Claus. I said for many years, and people thought I was just out of my mind, that I think I would get in more trouble in a lot of churches, not North Dallas, but in a lot of churches, if I stood before the congregation and said there's no Santa Claus. I think I'd get in more trouble saying that than if I said that there's maybe other ways by which a person can be saved. <laughs> they think I'm crazy. They think I'm crazy. They would say something like, well, you know, he's a little, his theology is a little off. But he, what he said about those babies, you got to get your kids out of here to cover your ears out. <laughs> and we get caught up in this season with myths, fables, and we lose it. And I'm telling you, I say this because this is my personal testimony. Somewhere around 96, 97, I'm talking to some friends. And I said to them, I said, you know what, man? Christmas just isn't the same as it used to be when I was a kid. Then I caught myself sometime later realizing the Advent season should be the same every year. It should have the same meaning every year. But I, I then, over time, realized that I was almost living a du double life, Pastor. 
Because what I wanted to do was go to my little church out there in the country and, and, and put on my robe and put a towel around my head and play a shepherd and, and get in there and say, this is what Christmas is all about. All the while knowing, I just want to get this out the way. Because it's time to get home and get to some getting. It was about me. No fault of my parents. I, I, I say they did control that. But I remember that's the way the season was presented to me. And when you build it on that kind of empty deception, falsehoods, it shapes the way you think. I still to this day think it should be cold out here during Christmas. <laughs> I built my life, my early life on every Christmas I had them named by the big toy that I got. Christmas 76, the big wheel Christmas. <laughs> Christmas 78, the Star Wars action figure Christmas. In fact, just to let you know how deep this thing goes, just to let you know how deep this thing goes, I might have something in here. Back in the day, me and my brother both got tablets for Christmas. You're looking at me saying, no, tablets came out in the early 2000s. Here's the tablet we had. <laughs> Still got it. No Wi-Fi connection. You don't have to worry about your Wi-Fi going down. Just shake it up. <laughs> yeah. Star. Star Wars action. Luke Skywalker. Take that. I know y'all wonder, what is he having that bag up there? <laughs> Christmas 79, it was a hot show on TV, The Incredible Hulk Christmas. <laughs> Used to fly around the house with this thing. <laughs> and the granddaddy of them all, Christmas 1982. The Atari 2600 Christmas. <laughs> in fact, do we, I don't have an Atari in this bag. I don't have an Atari in this bag, but I do have the original Pac-Man. <laughs> I'll never forget that because that game cost my parents about $59. I remember it. I remember the argument in the car. Because <laughs> my daddy said, hey, my, wife, my mom said, well, you got you to gotta give the child a game to play with it. And I remember my dad saying this, don't it come with a game? <laughs> but that's shaped. My Advent season, because it became about me getting stuff. And so I, I, I beg to differ in saying that it's harmless to talk to your children about these things, your grandchildren about this stuff, because it begins to shape their thinking. And there was a time when a kid asked the question of a parent and said to the parent, so if there's no such thing as Santa Claus, is there no such thing as this Jesus that you talk about? We gotta be careful in the myths that we tell our children. I'll never forget, I was preaching on seven last words at a church and mentioned something about Easter egg hunting. Made, this is a negative comment about it. I didn't say stop doing it, I just said something negative about it. Preached my heart out about Christ giving himself. And an older lady in the church came to me and said, you leave those babies alone. <laughs> That lets you know how deep this stuff goes. But see to it that you are not taken captive through empty deception. Because we need to understand this season is so important because it is a precursor to what is to come. Because guess what, folks? There's numerous prophecies out there now in the New Testament that tell us that Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he's coming back for everyone that would have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. And so for those of you who hasn't come back yet, but if there's someone here under the sound of my voice 
that has not accepted the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He is God in the flesh. And that he died for your sins. Death, burial, resurrection, and a promise that he's what? Coming back. You still have time. This message is for everyone. It's an extraordinary second coming that's going to take place. It's going to be different. This was a quiet one because he was in a manger, in a feed trough. He's not coming back in a feed trough. He's coming back for his church, and then he's coming back on another level to set up his kingdom. And it's not going to look pretty. You won't have a scene for that you can put in your yard. You don't have a yard big enough to hold the scene of what Jesus is going to do when he comes back. But it's encouragement in that message is that he is coming back and he's going to set up a kingdom with believers. And not only that, it has eternal significance. It's eternal significance because we know that that's where we're going to be. We've learned over the last two and a half years. how the story plays out. <laughs> this won't be a question like the SEC tournament. We're going to know who's going to win this thing. <laughs> and so what does that compel us to do today? Evangelize. Yeah. We need to tell people. This is a prime time season to tell people and answer Charlie Brown's question, what this season is all about. It is about evangelism and telling people that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he came to this life, he was born into this life, born into this world, lived, ministered, died, buried, raised from the dead, and is coming back. This is our time to evangelize, but we should be exalting him rather than exalting other things that are just empty deception and according to the elementary meaning the lowest level of thought and immaturity, principles of the world. Let us focus on exalting Christ during this season. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Gracious Father, we come now. Lord, we've heard the truth of your scripture. We pray that it was conveyed in a way that lives will be changed and attitudes about the season that we are currently in of Advent will be zeroed in and centralized on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But Lord, help us not to lose that enthusiasm after December 25th. Help us to keep that enthusiasm going through out the year and throughout the time that you leave for us in this earth. Because Lord, we are charged to tell the world, go into all the world and make disciples, telling them about you growing believers in you so that the kingdom would advance and you let us participate in that. Lord, forgive us when we don't exalt you. And we pray that this message does not fall on deaf ears, that we all grow from it, we are all changed by it, and we do something different in this season than we've never done before so that you get all the glory, you get all the honor, you get all the praise. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen.